In this tutorial, we're going to learn to make the sweater on the mannequin behind me. I've named this sweater three rectangles and two triangles. I named it that because I want to emphasize how simple these shapes are to knit. If you've never knit a sweater before, but you're comfortable with both knitting and purling, this could be a good first sweater for you. This is knit in uh, wool bulky yarn on size nine needles, so it's pretty quick to knit. I've also sized this sweater from extra small to 3XL, and I've included a couple of customizations um, in the video and in the pattern to help you get a perfect fit out of this sweater. And my hope is that what you learn here in this tutorial, you can take on with you to knit other sweaters. Um, if you'd like to get a copy of the pattern to follow along, you can click the link in the video description below to go to my website. I'll also give you a direct link to Ravelry where you can get the pattern, and I'll give you a link on here on screen as well. Um, speaking of customization, you might notice that there are no buttons, no zipper, no belt, nothing like that on this sweater. I built that in with the sweater. I, this is the sweater that I wanted to wear and I didn't want a fastener like that. But you'll see there's a pin, a brooch on the lapel. I designed this sweater with that design of pin in mind. It's called, this kind of pin has a million different names. A Celtic brooch, a penannular, a cloak pin, a Viking pin. There are lots of names for it because it's an ancient pin design. And I really like it because the, the pin itself, the design of the pin itself is the closure. And my tastes tend to lean towards the simpler things and I really like this. Anyway, when I was designing this sweater, I went online to see if I could find someone who made these pins just the way I like them. And I found a woman named Ali Shaw. She has an Etsy store and a website. She's a metal forger and she makes these pins. I dropped her a note and I said, hey, how about I uh, talk about your, your shop in a knitting tutorial coming up because um, I want to use this pin on my sweater. And she got back to me right away, which I adore that kind of customer service. And she said, yeah, mention away. I'll have some of these ready to sell. So um, I'll give you links to find Allie in the video description below. I'll tell you that she lives in England, but it was still just nine days shipping for me here in Texas from England to the US. And so chances are if you order your pin early, your pin will arrive in the mail before you even finish knitting the sweater. Now she calls this an Anglo-Saxon penannular brooch, just another variation on the name. And I, uh, the reason I have it here on the lapel is this is the way I plan to wear this sweater most of the time. But if I go outside in the cold wind, um, or, or it's just chilly outside, take the brooch, close up the sweater, one half uh, flaps over to the other half, and you just pin it here, and then you're protected against the cold wind. So this is what I did. If you do want to add buttons or a belt, those are certainly easy customizations to make. Now, um, now that I've talked up this pin so much, I want to show you how to work it because it can be a bit of a mind puzzle if you've never used one before. Let's go ahead and take a look. Here is a sample of the knitting, the mock rib stitch used in the pattern. And this is a littler, a smaller version of the very same pin that's on the mannequin right now. Ali sent me a couple of different sizes and I chose the the bigger one, um, I thought it was in better proportion for the sweater. Anyway, so it looks like this. These pins are really perfect for knits because this is not sharp. It goes between stitches without splitting them, you see? So that's the first thing you do is you find where you want to pin it, you put the pin through, and then fold it over and line up the gap in the ring with the pin. Once you do that, you twist the ring. I'm not doing a very good job, or this is a brand new pin too. It might be a little bit sticky. You know what I'm doing. I'm pushing one way with one hand and the other way with the other hand, which is stopping me up. There we go. So once you twist it, then it's secure. It's not going anywhere. And um, it's, that's the decoration. The decorative part of this pin is the closure. I think that's everything you need in the introduction here. Again, a link to get your pattern is in the video description below. And next up, we're going to get started on the knitting. To get started with the knitting, you're going to, of course, need your yarn and your needles and uh, your pattern. And for this, I used a bulky weight wool yarn, and I really recommend using a wool or a wool blend or another animal fiber with this. There's a lot of knitting there, and if you use, um, for example, a cellulose fiber, some acrylic fibers, it's going to make the sweater heavier and it isn't going to hang as nicely as this lighter weight wool will. Wool is warm, 
but the weight of it isn't heavy. And that's how I got the results here. Uh, so you're going to have everything ready. You're going to start by knitting a swatch, right? You're going to knit a swatch and you're going to wash and block that swatch according to the yarn directions. Because I made mine out of 100% wool, I did what I do every time I wash wool. I filled the sink with lukewarm water. I put my swatch in there. I let it soak. I squeezed out the water and let it dry flat. And that's when I checked gauge. Now, some of you are going to get really excited about this because for this sweater, you get to swatch a pocket. Yes, that's my new phrase, swatch a pocket. No wasted swatches here. You're gonna follow the directions to knit the pocket and then wash and block according to the, uh, the yarn's washing instructions and then measure your gauge. You want to make sure you wash it first because some yarns go nuts when they get wet and your sweater will end up being a very different size after it's wet. But if you uh, wash it first, before you start knitting, you measure your gauge on the washed swatch that will make all of the difference. So um, you'll do that, you'll wash it, you'll take measure your gauge, and I'll give you a link here for exactly how to measure gauge to make sure you're getting the correct number of stitches per inch before you start, because you may need to adjust your needle size uh, to get the, the perfect gauge. And then um, you'll have a pocket. You'll have a pocket finished. No wasted knitting. Not that swatching is ever wasted, but so you have that. Now, uh, Moving forward, I want to talk about how to work the mock rib stitch, which this whole pattern is knit in, mock rib. And let me see here. Yep, that's what we're going to do next. Let's go ahead and take a look at my sample. This is, of course, in the works and not yet blocked. And I want to show you, you see uh, how prominent these knit stitches are in the columns. And of course, this is in a different color than I'm about to swap out. But here it is, this is a, a, a blocked swatch. And the little beads of purl stitches between the columns of the knit stitches become more prominent after washing. I thought that was interesting. Here's apples to oranges or oranges to oranges. This is the exact same yarn, not, it's only been steam blocked, not wet blocked, and this is wet blocked. And you see how the bumps between the, the knit columns become more prominent. Okay, that's all I want to show you. Just a quick review of the mock rib stitch because it'll take you about two rows to memorize this. And it's very simple. You're going to start, every uh, edge stitch is kept in stockinette. So you have a knit stitch, we're on the right side row, yarn forward to work a purl stitch, yarn back to work a knit stitch, yarn forward to work a purl stitch. This is every right side row. That's it. That's it. I'm not going to do anything else fancy. I'm going to actually speed through this because I want to get to a wrong side row to demonstrate really the only other thing that you're going to need to know to do this. Okay, so that's a right side row. Now to work a wrong side row, it is just straight up purling. But I'm not gonna show you that. I'm going to show you how to bind off purl wise. Which is what I, um, throughout the pattern, every piece is bound off purl wise on the wrong side of the work. So I'm gonna start by purling two stitches and then I really just want to bind one off over the other. But to make this easier, I always pull the yarn back between the two needles so it's out of the way, so I can bind one stitch off. Then I pull the yarn forward again to purl another. Then I pull the yarn back just to get it out of the way, to pull that over, yarn forward to purl another. And this will leave you with the nicest edge on the right side of the work for seaming. Okay. With that finished, there's one more thing I want to show you. If you are going to use a wool yarn in your sweater, you have a great advantage in that you uh, can spit splice 
new balls of yarn together with, uh, without tying a bunch of knots in your yarn or having a bunch of ends to weave in when you're finished with the whole sweater. So I'm going to create a situation here. Let's pretend this is my work and I just ran out of yarn. I need to attach a new ball of yarn. And this is my new ball of yarn. This only works with animal fibers. You can try it on some blends. It's always worth trying because sometimes it, it does work. Surprisingly, it does work on blends, but it always works with animal fibers. So the first thing you want to do is untwist the plies. And this is a three ply yarn. I'm going to separate it two and one, two plies and one ply. ply. I'm going to cut an inch out of one ply. I'm going to go over to my new ball of yarn, untwist the plies, separate it half and half or as close as you can get, and I'll cut an inch out of the two plies on this one. Then I hold those together, and this is where the spit comes in. Don't let anybody tell you you can use water, because spit has something special. And the fuzz in your mouth <laughs> and when you're done <laughs> is also special. Then I'm going to twist these together. I'm going to keep talking with fuzz in my mouth. Twist these together and then pull that so the cut parts line up. And then you're going to use heat and friction to actually felt these pieces together. I'm actually going to use the leg of my jeans because that's way better friction than my, the palms of my hands. You can work at this to make sure it looks really good. And when you're finished, you have yarn with no break in it, no ends to weave in, no knots in your work. This is why I love wool yarn. One of the many reasons I love wool yarn. Okay, so you are going to make a back, a big rectangle back, two rectangle fronts, and a couple of triangle sleeves. And next up, we're gonna talk about um, Seaming the sweater, putting it all together. Once you get the pieces of the sweater finished, you're going to want to steam block them out into shape before you start seaming them. And when I say that, this is a, a way of just making sure they're really flat and square to make seaming easier. Uh, I can give you a link here to my steam blocking video, but really all you want to do is pin them out to the size the size, your size, I have listed in the pattern, and then use the steam iron and blast steam into the knitted fabric without pressing down with the iron. And when you do that, you can pat it out and it'll be smooth and flat enough to seam. And then once the whole thing is, is ste seamed together, you can do a wet block where you put the whole thing in um, the sink with wool wash. Um, first, let me show you exactly how this goes together. Let's take a look. I have a little mini sweater knit here. This is the back, and this is the right side of the work. Here's the wrong side of the work. So you have a big rectangle for the back, and then here is a front. The front piece is going to be wider than half of the back, and that's because it'll be seamed here at the shoulder, and then part of it lies open like this for the lapels where the pin goes here. And then if it's cold, you can fold it back up again and put the pin here to hold it shut. So you have um, the back and two fronts. I have just one front here. And then you have this shape, which is the sleeve. Yours is going to be much longer. <laughs> and the sleeve, once it's folded in half, fold, folded in half and seamed here, makes the rest of the sweater. So that's how the whole thing is put together. So these pieces have not been wet blocked, but they have been steamed blocked, and so they are ready to, um, to go together. The first seam that I'm going to do is across the shoulder. And this is um, going to be a, a stitch to stitch, a bind off row to a bind off row seaming. And that's what I want to demonstrate how to do. It's, you're going to actually hold the pieces like this to, to seam them together. And I give you guidelines in the pattern for how, to, um, how much to, to seam in leaving the back of the neck open and this part open for the lapel. But this is a place where customization um, can really work well for you. Uh, in the pattern, I give you a suggested amount to seam in, 
Try the sweater on. You'll do it on both sides. Try the sweater on. If it's staying up and fitting well, you're good. I found that uh, on my own sweater, the one on the mannequin, I had to seam mine in quite a bit more. And I'm not sure if it's because I have small shoulders or a thin neck or whatever it was. My sweater, just by taking it in a half inch on each side, it's, uh, the sweater fits so much better. So that's something that you can customize right there. So let me first show you how to do this side seam or this shoulder seam. Dramatic color change here, sorry about that. These are two mock rib samples and these are two bind off rows. And the way that these are going together right here is exactly the way the mattress stitch is going to work on the shoulder seams for you. I'm going to demonstrate this in um, some pretty good detail, but if you've never done the mattress stitch before, here is a link to my video that's dedicated to this stitch that will go over it very, very slowly for you. I'm also going to use this contrasting color of yarn to make it easy to see. You want to thread your yarn onto a tapestry needle, and uh, I'm starting here at what would be the outside edge of the shoulder. I'm going to put my needle from back to front into the very corner, I split a stitch there, into the very corner of this piece, going through once and then going through a second time in the same hole just to secure it there. And then I'm going to go through the very edge piece, the edge of the piece here. Okay, now the two pieces are pretty, um, pretty much attached to each other, don't pull that tightly yet. You have these V's that make up the, the bind off row and underneath each one you'll see that there are two legs of a V. Um, or two, yeah, in this case it's two legs of a V. Go underneath both of those legs and pull that through. Don't tighten it up yet. Jump over the other side and go under both legs of the first V you see there. Just under the V that runs this way. This one's going to run this way. Okay, then I'm going to jump back over to this side, go into the same hole I came out of here, and grab two legs of the next V. Okay, jump back over to this side, go back into the same hole I came out of, grab two legs of the next V. Over here, two legs. Going back into the same hole you came out of makes it really easy, and that's actually the reason I don't pull it tightly until I've finished a little bit more of it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pull it now. Um, this is what I call the magic moment. This is, it makes it easier to see, to put your needle back into the same hole you came out of, especially because you're going to be seaming with the same color yarn you used to knit the sweater and you won't have this awesome contrast like I do. But I also wait to pull it tightly because of this. Because that is awesome. Look how beautiful. Everything lines up and the seam is invisible. I need to pull it a little tighter down here. Okay, you see that? And so your shoulders are going to look really nice. You're going to seam the shoulder up to the, um, the distance I recommend in the pattern. Try it on and see if you want to adjust it at all before you fasten off this, um, this yarn that you're using for the seaming. I am just checking now to see if there's anything else I want to cover. Yes. Okay. The last bit of this, after you've done the shoulder seams, um, this is another area where you can do a little customization on the sweater for yourself. You'll have the shoulder seams stitched. The sides will still be open, no sleeves attached, because you can actually take this opportunity to measure how long, exactly how long, you want the sleeves to be for you. In the pattern, I give a recommended sleeve length, you know, using standards for sizing for the different sizes, extra small through 3XL, but I can imagine a really tall woman who happens to wear an extra small needing much longer sleeves than I list in the pattern for a standard extra small. So, this is a chance for you to get that just right. You're going to try on your sweater, and well, it's not a sweater yet, it's basically a back and two fronts that are seamed at the shoulder. And because this is a drop shoulder design, the shoulder will go down like this and part of the back and the sides will become the top of the shoulder. Your sweater will end here once you push it down over your shoulder like this. So you'll need some help with this. Put the pieces on, the, the sweater on, and then smooth it down over your shoulder like this, 
and then take a measurement from there to the end of your sleeve, how long you want the sleeve to be. So smooth the sweater down over your shoulder, start your tape measure there, hold your arm out and measure it down to how long you want the sleeve to be. I have really long arms, so I always think it's a luxury if I can get my sweaters down to this first knuckle on my thumb. That's one of the beauties of making hand, the beautiful things about making hand knits for me is getting the sleeve length long enough for me. So I measured from here down to here and that's how long I made the sleeves for myself. Um, if you're making the sweater for someone else, sticking to the standards that I put in the pattern should be pretty safe, but getting it just the way you want it is easy to do if you just have someone with a tape measure who can help you measure just how long you want that to be. Speaking of the sleeves, next up we're going to talk about seaming the sleeves and seaming the pockets on the sweater and that's pretty much the rest of the finishing work you have to do. The last bit of finishing work you'll have to do is to attach the sleeves and the pockets and I'm going to demonstrate that now. Let's take a look at how the sleeves come together with everything else. Here are the same tiny little sweater samples that I showed you before. We've already seen the shoulders. Here's the sleeve. You will fold it in half and it goes on like this. Very simple. This was really simple seaming here. It's a little bit different when it comes down to the sleeve. Let me open this up. You're going to attach it this way, which means that you're going to be attaching the bind off row to the side stitches, which makes things only slightly different, not that hard. I'm going to demonstrate that to you now. Oh, let me just say, the reason that it is a little bit different is because um, knit stitches are slightly wider than they are tall. So you want to pick up every stitch on the sleeve and skip every fourth on, I mean, I, I just got that backwards. You want to pick up every stitch on the body and skip every fourth on the sleeve. Promise me, it does work. I'm going to show you how to do it right now. We're back to these brightly lit samples here. I'm going to thread my tapestry yarn here and attach the yarn just the same way that I did before. This piece would be the sleeve. And this would be the body seaming into the side. You see how these are just square samples, but they, they end up being the exact same experience you'll have in the sweater itself. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to pick up the first stitch here. This is all just like we did before. And then pick up a ladder over here, two stitches over here. Pick up the next one here. And go into the same hole you came out of and pick up two here. This is really no different than what you just did last time but it's going to get interesting here in just a moment. Pick up two over here. So I picked up three over here and three over here. I'm going to jump back over to the sleeve again, but I'm not going to pick up the next VIC. I'm going to skip that one and pick up the next. And then I go into the same hole I came out of over here. Whoops, picking up two. So this is how it goes. You pick up every stitch on the body, and um, skip every fourth stitch on the sleeve and that will make it all match up and look right since the knit stitch is not a perfect square. And even though I knit in that crazy color, I'm going to have a really nice seam here. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, you're getting so close to wearing your sweater now, is I want to talk about um, the pockets. This is not in any proportions of the pockets, but what you'll do is you'll line up the rows, determine kind of where you want it. I've tried it on and I, I used um, some markers to pin exactly where I wanted the pocket to land. You have um, the columns here that you want to line up and you'll get it just where you want it and then using of course the same color of yarn that you used to knit the sweater and a tapestry needle, you want to make sure you don't stray from the same, not, you don't have to knit into a column, but just pick a spot and always, always just go, make sure you keep it straight and go back into the same stitch of the column going down. And there might be people who are better at sewing than I am who can suggest a different stitch, but this whip stitch seems to work pretty well. It's quick to work as well. 
And you'll do that all the way down and then make sure you're lined up when you come back up this way and your pocket will be secure. With all that done, you'll want to follow the washing instructions to wash and block your sweater. One hint, um, something that I did is this was pretty bulky when it was finished. It was very heavy, so instead of just wrapping it up in towels to remove the excess moisture, I have a top-loading washer. I was able to put it into the washer, turn it to spin, to spin out most of the water, and didn't do any harm to the sweater at all. It just spun out most of the water. And then it was light enough that I was actually able to pick it up and put it on the blocking board and let it uh, block to measurements. Anyway, that's it. I hope you enjoy knitting this sweater. I hope you love making it. Good luck. Thank you.